This section will cover clinical event prediction using multilayer perceptrons and recurrent neural networks. One clinical prediction use case is, given some previous events, predict what events will occur in the future. We can predict the probability of a specific future event or predict many events and rank them based on how likely they are. We can also predict the average duration until an event. Also, from these time series records, we can find similar patients and study their charts to predict the output of our current patient. However, defining these events will be a major challenge. How can we get consistent patient event coding? Let's talk about where we can obtain clinical data. Here, we will also have to think about how the data will be used because we should build systems using data that is similar to how they will be used when deployed. The KDRI, or the Kidney Donor Risk Index, is a great example here as it has been in use for a very long time, so we can learn a lot from its deployment. With this approach, the fields are not automatically entered. They are specified by a physician with knowledge that they're being used for a prediction. This is important because they will ensure the accuracy of the fields that they believe are important for their prediction. Also, these fields are collected in the same manner for training, validating, and using the model, which will allow us to be confident that the predictions work in general. To me, this is the best source of data because the inputs to a model are well-defined and well understood by a physician. An alternative source of data is from the hospital EHR system directly. Here, it is easy to create large retrospective cohorts of patients, but the fields are typically specific to that hospital and the software they use. This can limit the model's deployment as other hospitals will use other systems and have their own bias in data collection. Also, when data is entered, it is unexpected that it will be used to train a model. So systematic changes in data collection, such as changes in the standard of care, can negatively impact the performance of the model because these changes can be correlated with treatments unknowingly. The same issues are also present when using a billing or reporting system. A billing system may be nice because it is consistent across an entire province or hospital network, but each hospital may have its own standards when coding. Also, billing information may not paint the entire picture of a patient because it only contains a subset of events that occurred or, and were observed. In any case, this is just the reality and we need to develop methods to deal with this. ICD codes are commonly used for reporting and billing and offer an international standard that will help to use models from other institutions or share models that you build. There are proprietary alternatives that some EHR systems use, but they are very restrictive when it comes to developing models, so be cautious that this may limit the use of your models when you build them. Here is an example of the ICD coding system structure. There is a hierarchy of codes that become more and more specific. Here, we see the subcodes for 786, which are all related to chest and respiratory systems. If we drill down even more into 786.5, we can see even more subcategories. There are even some very specific and funny codes. Returning to our time series example, with this structure, we can then specify the exact codes needed to build a model in a well understood and transferable way. We can use multi-hot vectors to encode each time point. One simple approach to make predictions in this setting is to group all events in a previous time period together and then predict a future event in some fixed time period. This simplicity will allow us to generate many examples and avoid the model from becoming distracted from various artifacts that can exist in the data. To make it a prediction, a simple multilayer perceptron takes in a multi-hot vector specifying all the events and outputs a single probability. This is always the first thing to try before using a more fancy model. 
Another approach that will incorporate some ideas from word -tivec is the med -tivec model. In this approach, we will learn a representation for demographics as well as for each event code. The training proceeds as follows. A multi hot vector representing a visit is input into the model and is transformed using a nonlinear transformation. Then, this representation is concatenated with demographic information and is passed through another nonlinear layer. Then, this representation, which contains now the visit and demographic information, is used to predict the previous and future visits for that patient. What is special here is that demographics are explicitly given more importance than the other codes for the visits. Some other approaches are simply just predicting from a multi-hot vector of visits without including demographic information. Also, using an autoencoder which takes in the combined visit and demographics vector and learns representation in an unsupervised way. And another approach is using the word to vec model to learn representations for each code using the co-occurrence as a context to predict. Here is some analysis of these models based on their top 30 recall. Meaning, of the 30 highest probability predictions, how many were true positives? Note that this data set, on average, has seven codes per visit. Overall, these methods are largely similar in performance, and they demonstrate reasonable predictive power. Here we see four different hyperparameters being varied. Overall, it seems they don't have much impact on these models. One issue with this study is that although it was performed on a massive data set with over 500,000 patients, the data set is private, so we cannot replicate these results. The MIMIC data set from MIT provides a public benchmark that can be used for more consistent reporting. However, it only has 40,000 patients in an ICU setting, so it is not applicable to all situations. Another challenge which will motivate our discussions of RNNs is tasks which involve working with clinical notes. This task is extremely difficult because there is no restriction on how a note can be written. In this example, if we sim simply check for the phrase edema, we would come to the wrong conclusion about this patient as a sentence starts with, he denies. Although there have been some successes reported in predicting based on these notes, it is not something we should expect to get working easily. One way to cast this problem using recurrent neural networks is to simply read the text word by word, each time encoding that word and merging it with the internal states of the neural network. And then, at the end of the text, output a prediction of one or more codes. Some use cases for this are adapting old databases, which would only have text, into their corresponding ICD codes, or even helping to upgrade between versions of codes, as the more recent coding systems have more and more detail which is not captured by the older coding system, but may be present in the notes. Also, correcting errors in coding. If the predicted code from a note does not match what was in fact coded by that visit, that may be an error that should be investigated to ensure an accurate record for billing and recording purposes. There are many different styles of recurrent neural networks, so let's go over a few examples. A one-to-one -one model is similar to an MLP, one input and one output. A one-to-many is a sequence generation model. The model can decide how many units to output, or this can be a fixed number. A many-to-one model is similar to the previous example, where a sequence results in a single prediction. A many-to-many -many model is a combination of the previous two. Here, the model reads a complete sequence and outputs a single representation, and then from that representation starts outputting a new sequence. An alternative approach is to begin outputting the sequence before the input finishes. This is more relevant to tasks like audio, where sequences are very long and don't have a long-term dependence in order to make a correct transformation. 
So let's talk a bit about the basic structure of RNNs. We can call inputs X and outputs Y. H will refer to a hidden state. H will be the product of X in the previous hidden state, H. The basic RNN setup is shown here. We have three transformations, U, W, and V, that will be used for any length input. X is transformed using the matrix U, and the previous hidden state is transformed by the matrix W. The sum of these is passed into a 10H to produce the next hidden state. If this is the first character, then zeros can be used in place of the previous H. When an output is desired, then the H is transformed by V to produce a Y. We can see here what the computation looks like for a sequence. Here is an example where we only make a single prediction given a sequence. And here is an example where we only take a single input and then generate a sequence. When we don't have an input character x, we can simply just set a zero in place and the computation can continue. In the case of EHRs, here we can see how we would pass in multi-hot vectors representing ICD codes and output probabilities indicating ICD codes on the next visit. One classic issue with RNNs that you should keep in mind is called vanishing gradients. Here, the influence over long periods of time, or time steps in the network, is difficult to maintain. This is illustrated here using black having less and less influence over the next states. There are many approaches, such as attention and an LSTM, that can help to send these signals further down the network. There are also some creative architectures that are used to improve performance. Stacking is making the network deeper for each input, which is likely to enable more complicated representations of the input. Also, a bidirectional RNN helps to improve training because when making an output prediction, the model is able to see the entire sequence in both directions. Now let's return to RNNs applied to clinical predictions. In this work, called Dr. AI, an RNN is applied to a sequence of visits. The number of unique ICD codes in the input vector is 40,000, plus the duration since the last visit. The model here is a stacked RNN. The model outputs a vector representing the ICD codes expected on the next visit and the duration until that next visit. A key observation from this work is that the model worked better when predicting a subset of the codes, only 1,778, and not all 40,000. The 1,700 were selected using the hierarchy of the ICD codes, and the codes were grouped to be represented by their parent node. This makes sense because the loss during training would typically penalize a prediction that was medium cough instead of strong cough because they're all treated independently. The hierarchy is not built into these models by default and would consider them as different as a cat in a car. There are other approaches to integrate hierarchical information into models, uh, but this one is very elegant and simple. This model reports good performance, but again, it is on a data set that we don't have access to, so we can't replicate these results. Another interesting result from this work is when they evaluated the model on a public MIMIC data set. They found that training on MIMIC alone versus pre-training on their large data set and then training on MIMIC significantly improved performance. This is shown here in blue using pre-training and red without pre-training. The key takeaway here is that more data helps. Here are some references for further reading. 
Next, we will discuss an interesting task called medical natural language inference. Here, a model is given a premise stating baseline assumptions, then a hypothesis making a claim, and the model must decide if the statement follows, is neutral, or is a contradicting statement. This task is derived from the mimic data, so it's available to download. The main challenge here is to build models which really understand the concepts and can be then more useful in logically re reasoning about a medical situation. Here are some model predictions. From the responses, it seems that the current model used on this task doesn't have much medical knowledge. Finally, I will share some high-level insights about the field. Most of these methods ignore many measurements simply because they are hard to record digitally. These could be very predictive, and a physician can typically see and incorporate these different sources of information very quickly. There is a debate over using a model which provides superior accuracy but cannot be explained. Some would say that it is unethical to not use a tool that was superior in performance. However, understanding why a model is making predictions is the only way to know if it is not predicting using other attributes like income level or if the patient is insured. And finally, the lack of open medical data makes it impossible to verify the results of a lot of research work and perform external validation of your own work. Models may seem to work well in one hospital, but fail dramatically when applied to data from a different hospital.